Hello, I am Tegan Henke from the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute, and I want to welcome you to the final event in our eight-part speaker series. If you've been with us from the very beginning, thank you, and you know what a range of topics we've covered. We kicked off the series almost a year ago in February with a webinar on implementation science, and that set the stage for so many other topics, like using data to make decisions, selecting the right evidence-based practice for the population you serve, financing evidence-based practices, and last month's topic, measurement-based care. We've also had rich discussions about cultural humility, health equity, and ways to address childhood trauma and grief. And that brings us to today's topic, collaboration, and specifically the components that lead to successful collaboration. This is such an important topic and one we thought would be fitting as we wrap up this series. We know that no single organization can meet the varied needs of children and youth with mental health needs and their families. So we all know in a very real way how critical it is to have partners in this work. But where we often struggle is in establishing and sustaining a successful collaboration. Now, I wish I could say there's an app for that, but there might be something better, research. So for today's event, we welcome Dr. Paul Matesic, Executive Director at Wilder Research, where he has served in this position since 1982. He enjoys building a research team from diverse disciplines who work with others to improve the lives of individuals, families, and communities. Paul lectures frequently, has served on numerous nonprofit and community boards and committees, and has authored or co-authored more than 300 publications. Paul's books include Collaboration, What Makes It Work, and the forthcoming second edition of The Manager's Guide to Program Evaluation. He hosts the Talking Through the Numbers podcast and has kept a blog since 2005. Welcome, Paul. We're so happy to have you with us here today. And I know I have my own earmarked copy of your book, so I'm really excited to hear more about your work. Well, thanks, Tegan, and good morning or good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy and looking forward to the next hour of uh, sharing ideas about collaboration, saying a few things, getting to hear what you're interested in, and uh, just having a, having a good time for an hour. Great. Thank you, Paul. Before I turn it over to you, I want to remind our audience that this 55-minute session will be recorded, and we'll post it on our website within a few days. And, of course, that you'll be taking questions in both the middle and at the end of the webinar. So our audience members, please submit your questions using the chat or Q&A function on your screen. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Matesic. Hey, well, thanks again, uh, Tegan, and hello again. Uh, everyone to this uh, discussion of uh, collaboration, what makes it work, what makes it uh, successful. And I'm glad to be able to join you in uh, Texas today, even if remotely. Uh, I am, as Tegan said, from Wilder Research, which is part of the Wilder Foundation. We uh, Foundation, the larger foundation provides services to children, services to the elderly and a variety of services in between. And uh, in research, we work with uh, program partners on in a number of different ways. And one of them has been to identify the most successful ways that service agencies can collaborate with one another. And when we talk collaboration, what do we mean? Well, we mean a mutually beneficial, well-defined relationship entered into by two or more organizations to achieve common goals. And there's several words in there that are important. One is, you can see these highlighted, the word goals. The fact that the collaboration is moving toward something. It has a purpose. And that purpose is clear to all. The goals are clear to all. The goals are attainable. We'll be talking a little bit more about this as we discuss the components for successful collaboration. But that word goals is important that it has a jointly developed structure and some shared responsibility. That is, you can tell who's in and out of the collaboration and what they're supposed to do. That there's some mutual authority and accountability for success. That is, that there's truly some power within the collabor collaborating entities. They make decisions, they move forward based on those decisions. They're accountable, responsible for those decisions. And then there's a sharing of resources and rewards that revenues are coming in um, to fuel the collaborative activity uh, and any other rewards that uh, accrue from being part of this in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, community impact, they're shared by the collaborative group. Well, we were interested in what produces successful collaboration. 
And so what we did was a study for the first time close to 30 years ago, looking at all of the research that we could find on collaboration, those that succeeded, those that failed, and what it was that distinguished those from succeeded from those that failed. We did a meta-analysis, took the evidence from case studies to identify what we call factors that account for collaborative success. We don't have a step-by-step how-to as part of this. I'll talk a little bit more about collaboration being a process. It's not necessarily one simple step followed by another, but the ingredients are important to take into consideration when building a collaboration and when moving forward, jointly working to provide services, for example, to improve the quality of life for children. A third edition of the book that Tegan mentioned uh, just came out a couple years ago, and that took the most recent year's research on collaboration and enabled us to add some factors, refine some factors, and just add more information that would be helpful. What I want you to keep in mind is that collaboration is a process. It's not one thing that you do and overnight it's completed, but rather it's something that uh, must be worked on in an ongoing way. It's not the result of a formula or the product of a structure, for example. So if we were dealing with health, let's say, and we wanted to identify what are the ingredients of uh, being healthy, what makes you healthy, we might say things like, well, a good diet, eat the right things, uh, exercise appropriately, uh, be sure to wash your hands and uh, avoid contamination that way. Avoid exp exposure to chemicals, avoid polluted air. Um, have adequate medical checkups so you detect things early. Now, if you do these, you increase the probability of being healthy, but is it 100%? No, there's no guarantees. You could do all those things and still get sick. You might even become seriously ill, but the likelihood of remaining healthy is much greater. And so too with the factors that produce collaborative success. The more that you do them, and we're going to talk about what some of these factors are, the more that you do them, the more likely you are to be successful in your collaborative initiative. It's also important to keep in mind that collaboration is a process that requires attention and commitment and actual work. You must continually work to maintain collaborative success. It will have its ups and downs as anything does. Uh, there's no one way to do collaboration correctly, but if you engage in the activities that incorporate these principles of success, you're much more likely to actually be, be successful, provide the services that you want to provide, and have a strong impact on the communities that you serve. The next slide shows the categories of factors that resulted from the meta-analysis that we undertook. There are 22 factors for success. We're gonna talk about a select number of them today, but just for context and reference, they fall into six different categories. One is environment, where you're located, what the characteristics are of those, those communities, membership, who it is that participates in the collaborative activity, process and structure, how it is that you assemble and how it is that you get work done, communications, how you stay in touch with one another and with people outside of the collaborative, uh, purpose. I mentioned already the importance of having clear goals, uh, clear tasks and so on, and uh, resources, having the adequate people power, financial power and other resources that you need uh, in order to get the work of the collaboration done effectively. So those 22 factors fall into that. We've selected a number of them that seem most relevant for your circumstances, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each, each of those. One factor that's important is whether a history of collaboration or cooperation exists in the community. And, and that is that a history of collaboration or cooperation exists 
and that it offers the potential collaborative partners an understanding of the roles and the expectations required in collaboration and enables them to trust the process. It's different to work with people in other agencies. Even under the friendliest of circumstances, it's different if you've never done it before. And it's important that people have the cultural understandings of what is involved in working with other organizations. What are the norms? Uh, what's the etiquette involved? What are the expectations uh, for working together? If you're in a community where that already happens, you can get started much faster with a new collaborative uh, effort. If you are in a community where there's not been collaboration in the past, does it mean that, well, it's never going to happen? No, uh, you can start slowly. You can start to co-create some of these norms and expectations yourself, but you won't have a ready understanding among the collaborative partners of the give and take of working in a collaborative uh, situation. One of the implications of this is when you're planning a collaborative effort, you should be establishing your goals, your tasks, according to the level of development and understanding and acceptance of collaboration within, within the community. If your community doesn't have a strong history of collaboration, take smaller steps, uh, address this issue and maybe some of the other ingredients for success slowly before you try to go into a full-fledged effort uh, to collaborate. If you're in the unfortunate situation where there's a negative history with respect to collaboration, for example, where it was attempted, but organizations maybe were competitive or there was just some negative experience uh, that occurred, then you may take more time at the beginning to build trust, to build a common vocabulary, to build mutual expectations for what the work is you're going to do, and take other efforts to, to build on the success factors such as the ones we're discussing today. Another factor to keep in mind is what's called mutual respect, understanding, and trust that members of the collaborative group share an understanding and respect for each other and their respective organizations, how they operate, their cultural norms and values, limitations and expectations. There's no quantitative way to say which of the success factors are the most important, but I will say based on my observations over time, both from the research and from working with organizations who have been collaborating, that this is one of the top two success factors. And I'll tell you what the other one is when we get to it. But mutual respect, understanding, and trust seems to be a really fundamental building block for forging the bonds that are necessary for organizations to have, the staff in those organizations to have, in order to collaborate uh, effectively. And you know, you could ask, is it possible in any relationship uh, to succeed without having some level of respect, understanding, uh, and trust? It doesn't mean that you're going to understand everything that the other organization is doing. It doesn't mean that you will agree with the other organization on everything. But it does mean that you will have a sufficient bond with that other organization that whatever disagreements there are, whatever ambiguities there are, you're able uh, to get through them effectively. One of the implications of this is that when you start in a collaborative initiative, it's often best for the partners to temporarily set aside the key purpose of the collaboration and take some time just to learn about one another. Have a meeting where you're talking about some of your individual goals, your careers, your backgrounds, why it is you're doing the work that you're doing, whatever it might be to get to know one another personally and to build the understanding and trust and mutual respect that are necessary to work together effectively. Partners have to be honest about their intentions and their agendas in order to cultivate trust. And again, they don't have to have identical intentions and identical agendas 
But if everything's transparent, it will build the trust that's necessary in order to, <clears throat> to be uh, successful. So as you begin to engage in collaboration, as you initiate the work, be sure you allow time for trust to develop, allow time for all the partners uh, to be understanding one another. And I will repeat what I said at the outset about collaboration being an ongoing process requiring commitment. Trust isn't something that you build and then you say, oh, we have it, now let's go on, it's always there. It's something that does need to be worked on uh, continuously. Um, staff may change, conditions may change, crises may develop, and you'll need to continually undertake activities that maintain respect, understanding, and trust. Another important characteristic uh, of uh, collaboratives and an ingredient for success is being sure that you have an appropriate cross-section of members, that to the extent that they are needed, the collaborative group includes representatives from each segment of the community who will be affected by its uh, activities. So as you get into a collaborative and you think, what is it we're trying to do? What effects do we wanna have in the community? Who needs to be involved? You will wanna review carefully which organizations are being included, how they're being included, and ensure that you have an appropriate uh, cross-section of members. And I've seen collaboration break down in a variety of situations where those who initially became involved didn't recognize that there were others who really uh, needed to be involved as partners. And the effectiveness of the initiative, uh, well, the, the initiative was just never, never actually effective. And ultimately many of them uh, dissolved. A next factor that is important to consider is that the members of the collaborative group must see collaboration as in their self-interest. That collaborating partners believe that they will benefit from their involvement in the collaboration and that the advantages of membership will offset costs such as loss of autonomy, loss of turf. We were in the in a room together, oftentimes one of the things I do is I say, um, you know, raise, raise your hand if you have a lot of time when you're not busy and you're just looking forward to find some extra work. And uh, maybe any of you who are in that situation right now where in your jobs, you're twiddling your thumbs most of the time, you just want to fill idle time, put it in the chat that that's your situation. I know that not a single one of you uh, will do that because in providing services, we're all very busy. We're often more than busy. We're often working more hours uh, than we're supposed to work. Uh, we're often working odd hours. Uh, there's a lot of pressures in the jobs that we have. So if we're gonna add something else onto our plate, then it's important that we see that it's really going to be in our self-interest. There's always opportunity costs and time spent um, with collaboration is time spent away uh, from something else. So as strategists who are designing a collaboration and as you're moving forward, sustaining a collaboration, you need to make sure that you and all of the partners in this can maximize, maximize their advantages. And if they can't maximize their advantages, then they'll start dropping out and the collaboration will not uh, succeed. So it's very important that organizations, the staff in those organizations, see collaboration in their self-interest. They see how it fits with their mission. They see how it'll be helpful. And that will get through the initial time of developing the work and it will sustain the motivation necessary to continue the work. 
The next factor I'd like to take a look at relates to process and structure, and specifically that members share a stake in both the process and the outcome of the collaboration. The members of the collaborative group feel some ownership of both the way that the group works and the results or the products of its work. And there's two important concepts here. One is the word process and the other is the word uh, outcome. And what you wanna be sure is that whoever is participating in the uh, collaboration does have a role in both of these. Oftentimes a mistake is to call people together and just talk about the outcome that there, there may be some organization that takes leadership and says, hey, I'll sponsor the meeting. It'll be, at, uh, it'll be at our place. We have a great conference room. And they bring everybody in and they present the agenda and they say, we're gonna get everybody involved in saying what is going to be the goal of this collaboration and how we're going to achieve that goal. And what they've overlooked is that they haven't asked people, well, is that even the right process for deciding what the goal is? Should that organization be the one that calls everybody in its conference room? Is the agenda the right agenda or is it, should it be a different agenda to come to decisions about how this is gonna happen, what the partners are gonna do, what the key outcomes are going to be? <clears throat> so it's very important to start at a very, very basic ground zero level and be sure that the members share a stake in the process of figuring out how the, pro how the initiative is going to be designed, as well as determining uh, the outcome. You in getting into a collaboration should devote the time and the resources necessary to developing ownership among all the partners in the process and the outcome. You should be sure that everyone can participate in regular planning and monitoring of collaborative effort and that'll solidify ownership and ongoing commitment. This is something that needs to be done at the initiation of the work and something that needs to be attended to over time. A next factor that's important for you to keep in mind uh, as you're undertaking collaboration is something called multiple layers of participation. That every level, in an organization, in each partner organization, upper management, middle management operations has at least some representation and ongoing involvement in the collaborative initiative. Okay. Um, if I ask for a show of hands, again, I can't do it online so well, but if it, we were in person, I would. I often ask how many of you have ever been in a situation where leaders somewhere up the chain cooked up an agreement without consulting you or maybe some other people who are gonna do the work. I could raise my hand, that happens, has happened to me in past years, not recently, uh, fortunately. Um, it can also happen the other way around, uh, that operations people or service delivery professionals, they can cook up some kind of a very good well-intended initiative, but not involve some of the top managers. And when there's a mismatch like that, it can ultimately lead to an explosion and a breakdown in the collaborative process. So it's important to recognize the multiple layers of staff in each partner organization and get them involved. This helps to institutionalize the collaboration. It also can mitigate some of the negative effects that can occur as staff turnover or plans and organizations uh, change uh, and so on. Does this mean that everybody at every level has to be equally involved for the same number of hours? No, absolutely not. There might, it might be that the top level of the organization has only consulted the 
an hour and two every several months about what's going on. It depends on what an organization needs, but to have absolutely no participation from the from one or more of these levels, that's likely to lead to uh, failure of the collaboration. A next factor I wanted to mention is the development of clear roles and policy guidelines. That the collaborating partners clearly understand their roles, rights, and responsibilities, and they understand how to carry out those responsibilities. It's important, and I don't think this ingredient for success should surprise you. It's important that you have a clear understanding of the roles and the rights and the responsibilities of the partners up front. It's important to reach agreement on these things and to communicate them clearly to all the partners. Uh, do you need to do this in writing? You don't need to. Should it be in writing? Yes, I would strongly recommend that, uh, that there's at least some kind of a memo could be a simple page, it could be a lengthy legal contract, but the important roles and the important guidelines should be very clear to everyone uh, who's involved. Another factor that actually just came to prominence in the most recent look that we took at the research literature is the existence of evaluation and continuous learning that the collaborative group has an established process for measuring its activities and effectiveness and collaborating partners review these measurements, learn from them and use them to guide improvement. And maybe this uh, has emerged as important in the last 10 to 15 years because it reflects an interest during that time in evidence-based practice and uh, data-informed decision-making. And it seems to, uh, be a factor that distinguishes the more successful collaborations from the less successful or even failed collaborations, that they are constantly taking in information and using that as a means of judging whether they're on the right track, how they can improve, uh, how they can increase the impact that they're having on their communities. The next factor brings us to the other big one, you remember before when I was talking about mutual respect, understanding, and trust, I said that uh, there were probably two factors that were most important in my mind, and open and frequent communication is the other. That the collaborative group members interact often, update one another, discuss issues openly, convey all necessary information uh, to one another and to people outside of the group. Uh, this shouldn't surprise any of us. Communication is just so important in all social relationships. So right from the beginning in your collaborative initiative, you should be setting up a system for communication. Uh, what is it that you think everybody needs to know? When do they need to know it? How do you update them on those things? What channels do you give people to bring up questions and to get information? You should be identifying the partners who are responsible for communication. It may be that there's a function assigned to a certain staff person in one or more organizations, especially if the, the collaboration is large or if it's complicated. Um, you need to plan your communication strategies to reflect diverse communication styles and the needs of members. Uh, and you need to just acknowledge that there will always be some communication shortcoming or breakdown somewhere, uh, and then you'll have to act to fix it. Um, that's inevitable. But if you pay attention to communication, you're paying attention to one of the most important factors for success. And the, <clears throat> the last factor that I want to mention uh, is sufficient funds, staff, materials, and time. Uh, this is probably obvious. Uh, so I guess it's good that the research confirms it. It's a validity check, so to speak, but you have to have money. Uh, you have to have people. You have to have materials. You have to have adequate time. That the collaborative group has an adequate, consistent financial base, along with the staff and materials needed to support its operations. It allows sufficient time to achieve its goals and includes time to nurture the uh, collaboration. Obtaining adequate resources, 
must be a priority in forming a collaborative uh, group. And I know that in our business, in the human services, uh, nonprofits, resources are often uh, limited. But it's important as you're getting into collaborative initiative to be sure you have those resources. And sometimes one of the ways to help increase resources is to work on some of the other today or others of the 22 factors we don't have time to talk about today because sometimes strengthening them can attract more funding uh, for you. But what I want to mention, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but I want to mention it uh, before I end these remarks, is that although we get into collaboration in order to become more efficient, become more effective, ultimately save time, perhaps save money, reduce expenses, in the short run, the initiation of collaboration often involves more time, more money, more work. So if you initiate collaborative efforts, don't expect that your workload will immediately decline. It may in fact increase. Your expenses may increase. In the long run, you may save a lot of time and money, you may feel a lot better about the work you're doing. You may see much more community impact. But in the short run, collaboration can take a lot of effort to get started. So you want to be sure that you have sufficient funds, staff, material, and time during that initial phase to get things off in the right direction. With that, I've about reached the half of the uh, hour that the Organizers allotted me for formal remarks, and I'm happy to move into some questions. Yeah, Paul, thank you so much. We have some questions coming in, and I just want to invite some other folks to go ahead and submit your questions either in the chat or Q&A function. But I um, just wanted to start with, you know, in some ways, like, well, one, I like the, the last part that you were just sharing, because in some ways, some of these are, are obvious, and it seems like it would be easy for at the beginning of a collaboration to kind of gloss over things like, oh, yeah, we work well together. We know, we kind of know each other, you know, at least informally, and to kind of gloss over some of the things it takes to really build those norms, build the um, roles and responsibilities, and kind of establish a different type of trust with one another. And it feels like slowing down, like it's easier to focus on the outcome and what you want and sort of full steam ahead instead of kind of stopping and, and slowing, slowing things down. It feels counterintuitive. And that makes me, gives me some like anxiety. Is that, is that typical? Does that happen with, with organizations? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. And you know, there's going to be some amount of anxiety whether you move too fast or too slow. Uh, but what's important, there's actually another factor that came out of the research we didn't have time to talk about, but it's uh, an, what's called an appropriate pace of development. And you have to size up for the effort in which you're engaged of how quickly can you actually get started and, you know, and make sure that the energy you have matches the opportunities make sure that the resources you have matches the expenditures and other assets needed for particular tasks that have to be, have to be done when you're starting the work. Uh, and that's a, that's a judgment call that you'll have to, to make when you're uh, initiating the collaborative work. So kind of returning to your first, your very first point that collaboration is a process and not necessarily a step-by-step. -step. Right, exactly. And it'll differ a little bit in every in every place. Uh, there's, there's always some different circumstance in the environment, or there's different levels of familiarity that organizations have with one another. So there's always a certain amount of customized activity in that process. We have one question asking um, if you have an example that you can share about communities, a community or an organization that you've worked with um, to, who use these factors to build a successful collaboration. Do you, are you able to give a quick, a quick example? Uh, yes, there, there have been several. Um, one that comes into my mind was actually a network of organizations in uh, New Jersey, 
uh, at serving children, if I remember, and that's why I'm trying to bring back in my memory banks. This is about 10 or 12 years ago, but uh, they used the factors. They used the uh, collaborative factors inventory, which if we have time, I'm gonna say a couple words about uh, to measure where they were on these factors. And they paced the development of their collaboration to serve children uh, based on how they scored on the factors and they identified things they needed to do to strengthen themselves before they could uh, move forward. So that, uh, that's one example. So going, so using that inventory, which I know you said you'd be able to talk about, and we can um, share some additional information with folks who are interested too um, after after the webinar, because we've been we've been using it as well. Um, so thank you for that. So using the inventory and then targeting those areas where the scores the scores reveal a need to to improve. Right. Yep. Um, so one more question: Did the research that you that you did related to all of these factors, and especially as the resources and time and and having a lead organization, does that did the research suggest the need for the backbone organization, or how how do you share power when you're doing a collaborative? Or can you speak a little bit to kind of sharing power, even as there is like a backbone or lead organization? So the, um, the research that we did, it, it, there's two parts to your question. So first of all, on the backbone organization, the research that we did did not point directly to the need for a backbone organization in the, the same sense that it's often used, for example, in collective impact init initiatives. Um, but the factor, the last factor I, or I described, uh, sufficient funds, staff, materials, and time, as well as the ones that I didn't, which has to do with uh, leadership of the collaborative, both do support the notion that you need, you need some organization that's going to make sure that the resources are channeled, that there's certain basic work that's being done, that the leadership function is being performed, whether that's by one leader or a co-leader, uh, but it, that, it's, that it's being done. So there's a lot of evidence consistent with the notion of uh, the importance of a backbone, a backbone organization. In terms of shared power, one of the things that often comes up as a question is, can the members of a collaborative truly be equal partners? And of course, you could get into trying to define what it means to truly be an equal partner, but I think the, the gist of it is, can they, can they treat one another more or less as equals, especially when outside of the collaborative, there may be very major differences among them and even uh, power relationships that create differentials. So if you have a collaborative that involves the Department of Human Services, which has a hundred million dollar budget and a community organization that has, you know, a hundred thousand dollar budget, they're never going to have the same power in one sense. But what seems to be important is when they come into the collaborative initiative, as much as possible, they do need to treat each other as uh, equal partners and equal representatives, or else you will fail on that uh, mutual respect and trust factor. So recognizing the value that each organization brings to the table, kind of regardless of the scope of, of their work in the community, um, that this, the value is, is equal, but they may do on a larger or lesser scale. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think we'll wrap up the questions for right now, but I know you're going to get into what some of the, uh, another question that I had, which is some of the obstacles that communities often face um, when they're developing these collaborations. So I will turn it back over to you and we'll have more questions at the end. So folks keep su submitting your questions. Yeah, and I know we just have about, uh, what is it, 15 minutes left. So. I'll take a few minutes, as Tegan said, to talk about some obstacles and at least offer initial thoughts on how to overcome them. And then um, we can do more, more questions, see what you're interested in till the, 
till the closing. The most common obstacles relate to the two factors that I said were most important. So uh, when I occasionally get calls from people uh, who are having problems, and it's not, it's not real often, I more often get calls from people who want to talk about collaboration like we're doing today or uh, just want a workshop or want some kind of consulting or advice. But when, when a call comes in that, hey, this is breaking down and it's not working, and I start talking with people involved, one or the other of these issues is most likely to come up. One, that there is somehow not enough communication among the people who are participating, uh, sometimes with uh, the thought that even the lack of communication is on purpose. Uh, the other issue is lack of trust. And of course, that can be heav heavily overlapping with the lack of communication that there's not communication, so people aren't trusting one another, uh, or there was not an adequate understanding of what was involved that was transparent at the beginning, and now people are feeling like, oh, I didn't think I got into it for this reason, and why are we expected to do such and such? And um, those are the, the two most common obstacles. And to prevent both of these from occurring, there are some things that I think are uh, important to do. And I'll start with communication because I think dealing with communication can both solve communication problems uh, or prevent them and also do a lot to build trust and potentially build, uh, eliminate or prevent the problem of uh, lack of trust. So with respect to communication, it's really important to identify the key stakeholders. And so what I mean is let's just, I, I, I don't know for each of you, whether what kind of collaboration you're gonna get into and how many partners it will involve and so on. But let's just say you were gonna get into a collaboration with four others. So there's a total of five of you. It's important to ask who are the key stakeholders in those five partner organizations? Who are the top institutional leaders? Remember what we talked about, multiple layers of levels of communication, that you wanna be sure that the top people at least know about and have some voice in shaping what's happening in the collaboration. Are there committee chairs, task force chairs? Um, are there other staff who are in these organizations? Who, who are they? Uh, because those are the people with whom you're going to need to communicate. Secondly, what you should do for those stakeholder groups is to specify the frequency and type of communication involvement that you will have with them. Uh, will it be in person? Will it be an email they receive? Will it be a newsletter? Will it be a meeting? And actually this, uh, when I'm in person, I draw a version of that matrix that you see there, and I start to fill it in. And down the first column, I might write in something like uh, staff in one in the row, and I might write something like uh, CEO, organization CEOs in one of the rows or whatever. And then down each of the columns, I'll put a type of uh, mode of communication. So in-person, email, newsletter, uh, whatever it might be. And then in the cells in there, we'll show the frequency. So it might say, uh, with the top leader of each organization, once every six months, there will be an in-person meeting to update them. Or there will be a formal memo that describes the, pro process, the uh, progress of the collaboration. Whatever it might be, uh, board of directors of the organization, that at least every year they get some kind of a report. Um, right now, I'm involved in a collaborative initiative that involves a number of foundations in Minnesota. And we have a little matrix like this. And for example, it specifies that every four months, 
the president of each of those foundations will get a personal email from me that's two or three paragraphs long. It talks about what the, the initiative has achieved during the past few months, what our plans are. And it says, if you have any questions at all, here's my phone number, you have my email, let's talk. So it maintains a personal relationship. That's really important. And then finally, stick to the plan. Whatever is in that plan you've developed, be sure that if you say you're gonna send an email on a regular basis, or you're gonna have an in-person meeting, or you have some kind of a newsletter or something, that you do it on schedule. That's really uh, important. This will prevent a lot of communication problems and also um, uh, help to build trust. As we move to trust, there's a number of things you could say, but um, I just wanna mention a few of them. And one of them is the importance of promoting interaction. When people see each other and get to know each other, it's much easier to build trust. And we didn't talk about the importance of both formal and informal communication, but I'll bring it up now that it's important to have the clear formal channels for communication, like the ones that I mentioned in the previous slide, that on a regular basis, you're sharing information, you're inviting two-way communication, you're holding appropriate meetings, you're giving people a stake in things formally. It's also really important to create opportunities for informal interaction, that people have some time to get to know each other as individuals informally. Things I like to do are uh, to build in some time at the end of meetings. I often aim to end a meeting 10 minutes early because what happens, people actually talk to one another. They don't run out the door. Of course, it's all different now during uh, the time of remote meetings, but when we had them in person, this was a really effective way for giving people a chance to talk to one another. A number of years ago, I was asked to help out with a collaborative that was struggling. It was a healthcare collaborative and they just weren't making progress. The, the things, just, things just weren't gelling. And one of the things that we did was uh, we brought a few people together at a coffee shop one day at the end of the day. And we just had people talk over coffee small segment of the people who are in, in this collaboration. And once they got talking to each other, then they said, hey, let's come back and do this again in a couple of weeks and we'll invite a couple more people. And these informal meetings then produced a, a spirit and a feeling among people where they were able to come back much more effectively into the formal meetings. So it's important to create those opportunities and just always being transparent making sure that every decision, every plan is out there in front of people so that they can see it. Finally, in terms of these uh, obstacles, having a culture in which you're humble, allowing adequate time, treating each other as equal partners. I talked about that before when uh, Tegan asked a question about it and being willing to compromise. You have to realize that if you have multiple partners involved in an initiative, not every single one of their priorities will be met. Not every single decision will please them 100%, will please you 100%. So it's really important to have the ability to compromise. And that's, that, that's clearly uh, something that influences success. Uh, the last thing, <clears throat> excuse me, last thing I would say is to go back to that uh, Wilder Collaboration Factors Inventory that we mentioned already. It's a self-assessment tool uh, that you can use to see where you stand on the factors that influence collaboration, success of collaboration. Um, you can take it for free on the, uh, the web. You can do as many times as you want. There's ways you can get individual scores, group scores. Um, you can see it in the book we mentioned, Collaboration, What Makes It Work. Um, and you can see an explanation of it and uh, get some ideas on how to use it. So I would encourage you uh, to do that. And I know that uh, you already have, uh, many of you uh, have been asked already uh, to complete 
the CFI. And uh, that, that should be helpful, should be helpful to you. So that's all that I was going to say. And I know we just have about uh, maybe four minutes left, but if there's more questions, I'm happy to keep talking. Yes, we do have some questions. So thank you again, Paul. That was really great information. Um, so one one question that we that just came in is, you know, what role can outside um, consultants or outside folks play to help collaboratives succeed using these factors? So what specific are there some like activities or coaching techniques that can help? Can you point us to resources that that we can use or even that, you know, somebody, a, a group within a collaborative can use to help um, to help their larger group to become more successful or to strengthen some of the areas where they might where they might be struggling. Yeah, so I, I think uh, consultants can be very valuable. Most of the factors, probably all, but uh, at least most of the factors that exist uh, the, among those 22 have uh, practical ways to increase uh, your strength of on the factor. Uh, and some of those, you know, I was just mentioning. So for example, if people ask me about ways to improve communication, I will often work them through uh, in more detail that kind of plan that I was describing of identifying the stakeholders and how is it that you want to contact them and what do they need to know and where do you need to be sure you build in opportunities for back and forth interaction and what do you do if problems come up so those are things that consultants uh, can or those are places where consultants can often often offer tools and advice that would be helpful uh, to you there are resources, I would say, just search on the internet. There's various guides <clears throat> that can help with different aspects of uh, collaboration. And I would say uh, searching for them could be helpful. Right, well, I might wanna pick your brain about that later because the internet is wild and <laughs> wild and open. So I might need help vetting some of those resources, but that's great. Well, one of the things that stuck out to me too while you were um, sharing information about building trust is some of, the, some of this might require just like a reframe of um, what it, like how useful those informal interactions are. Cause I know when I get really busy and overwhelmed, one of the first things to go for me is those like informal check-ins and, you know, wanting to stick around. So I'm like, okay, I've got 10 extra minutes. Now I'm going to run off to do the, the other thing that I need to do. And so I've had to kind of, in my own life, kind of stop and reframe those interactions. And so do you have any tips for doing that sort of at a, at a higher level with multiple, because I know we have so many busy people. So how do you reframe that, that these informal interactions are actually serving a purpose and it's not just, you know, coffee or happy hour or whatever it is? Yeah. So I would suggest a couple of things. Uh, well, what, you know, one really practical trick that I do is sometimes at the beginning of meetings, I have an agenda item that involves people sharing something, uh, you know, more personal, you know, like what, what's some happy thing that happened to you in the past month? It doesn't have to be work related, it could be in your personal life, whatever it is. So then you're kind of forcing them and not allowing the escape valve you were just talking about that you used. Um, Although I will say that ending meetings early, oftentimes somebody else, you know, people will catch each other, and uh, mm -hmm. it it does it does uh, it does work. Um, is there another part of your question? I thought I was going to say something else. Now I'm forgetting what it was. No, I think you yeah, just like reframing the value around those informal interactions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, the leader, whoever's in charge, has to realize how important this is. And in the spirit of collaboration being an ongoing process and something you have to work on, has to figure out how to custom fit those opportunities in. Because it's just something that, you know, if you don't do it once or twice, you let a month or two go by without having some informal interaction, fine, that's not going to kill the collaboration. But if you do it for six months or eight months, and people are feeling pressured, they're overworked, maybe things are going wrong with the partnering activities, then that's where it's gonna cause a major problem. Well, that makes sense. 
All right, and I see that we are at time. So um, on behalf of our whole team at the Meadows Institute, I wanna thank you, Paul, for being with us today and sharing such valuable information. And of course, I wanna thank all of you in our audience who joined us today and throughout this year. We hope you've enjoyed the series as much as we have and have found the information valuable to your work. We'd love to hear from you if you want to share your experience with us about this speaker series. And if you'd like to watch or rewatch any of the previous webinars, we will continue to make them available on our website. So thank you all for joining us today and for all the work you do to improve the lives of Texans. Thank you and take care.